Great, awesome. So this uh, this sub element, sub element T6, will be about electrical components. Oops, I accidentally minimized my screen. Um, circuit diagrams and component functions. For the EEs out there, this stuff will be second nature by the time you're in like second to third year, uh, or even maybe now. But um, yeah, uh, doesn't mean you have to understand it too much right now, though. <laughs> I think they mentioned this earlier, but the ham cram is all about memorization. Um, unless you choose to uh, go further into it. But yeah, let's get started. All right, which electrical component opposes the flow of current in a DC circuit? So this will be resistor, like a resist <laughs> resistor. Alrighty. What type of component is often used as an adjustable volume control? A potentiometer. So this is one of the components with the knobs on them. So, yep. Potentiometer. What electrical parameter is controlled by a potentiometer? Resistance. It varies the resistance. What electrical component stores an electric field? Capacitor. What type of electrical component consists of two or more conductive surfaces separated by an insulator? A capacitor. What type of electrical component stores energy in a magnetic field? An inductor. What electrical component is usually constructed as a coil of wire? An inductor. What electrical component is used to connect or disconnect electrical circuits? A switch, like a light switch. You can use it to turn off and turn on the lights. What electrical component is used to protect other circuit components from current overloads? Fuse. Which of the following battery types is rechargeable? All of the above. <laughs> All of these choices are correct. So don't even look at the other ones. Which of the following battery types is not rechargeable? Carbon, zinc. What class of electronic components uses a voltage or current signal? to control current flow. Transistors. What electronic component allows current to flow in only one direction? A diode. Which of these components can be used as an, an, as an electronic switch or amplifier? A transistor. And, uh, by the time you're in your third year, you will be dealing with transistors a lot. <laughs> Which of the following components can consist of three layers of semiconductor material? Again, it's a transistor. Which of the following electronic components can amplify signals? a transistor. So by controlling the flow of current, you, uh, you can also amplify signals. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if that's the best way to put it. But yeah, moving on. How is the cathode lead of a semiconductor diode often marked on the package? How is it indicated on the physical component? With a stripe. So the, uh, the cathode is the negative side. Stripe is negative. What does the abbreviation LED stand for? Light emitting diode. What does the abbreviation FET stand for or FET? Field effect transistor. What are the names of two electrodes of a diode? 
anode and cathode. Which of the following could be a primary gain producing component in an RF power amplifier? A transistor, again with the amplification. What is the term that describes a device's ability to amplify a signal? Gain. Like amplifying, gaining. Yep. What is the name of an electrical wiring diagram that uses standard component values? Oops, sorry, standard component symbols. That is a schematic. What is the component um, one in figure T1? So when you do the ham cram, they'll have like a, a lot of pictures in the back of the packet. Um, or is, since you're doing it online, it'll just be on the page under the question itself. But yeah, that's a resistor. <laughs> okay, what is component two in figure T1? Transistor. What is component three in figure T1? That's a lamp. Kind of looks like one if you look hard enough. What is component four in figure T1? That is a battery. What is component six in figure T2? A capacitor. What is component eight in figure T2? That is a light emitting diode. You can see these little arrows here are supposed to represent the light coming off of it, I guess. <laughs> What is component nine in figure T2? That is a variable resistor. We also kind of use this for potentiometers since potentiometers are variable resistors, but uh, think of moving this arrow back and forth. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what it is. It's a variable resistor. What is component four in figure T2? A transformer. What is component three in figure T3? A variable inductor. So this kind of looks like the, the one back here, but you'll notice this one's spiky. So resistors are spiky. Inductors are round. So I just know that. What is component four in figure T3? That is an antenna. It's sticking up in the air, just like an antenna. What do the symbols on an electrical schematic represent? Electrical components. So by symbols, they just mean things like that. So yep, those are all electrical components. Which of the following is accurately represented in electrical schematics? The way that components are interconnected. So how does the, uh, the battery connect to the resistor and whatnot? Yep, that's the way components are interconnected. Which of the following devices or circuit changes, uh, which of the following devices or circuits changes in alternating current into a varying direct current signal? 
That is a rectifier. What is a relay? That's an electrically controlled switch. So you use uh, another electrical signal to say the switch should be opened or closed. So a relay is an electrically controlled switch. That's a good point. No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, which of the following devices or circuits changes in alternating current? Didn't I just go over this one? Hold up. <laughs> Wrong way. Okay. Uh, what type of switch is represented by component three in figure T2? Oh, there's no picture here. Uh, that's a single pole, single throw. Which of the following displays an electrical quantity as a numeric value? A meter, like a voltmeter or an ammeter. Which, oh, sorry, what type of circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? That's a regulator. A regulator controls the amount of voltage from a power supply. What component is commonly used to change 120 volts AC house current to a lower AC voltage or other uses? That's a transformer. Which of the following is commonly used as a visual indicator? LED, or light emitting diode. Which of the following is combined with an inductor to make a tuned circuit? A capacitor. What is the name of a device that combines several semiconductors and other components into one package? An integrated circuit. So think combines, integrates, integrated circuit. What is the function of component two in figure T1? So that's this one with the circle around it. Um, that is the transistor, and it controls the flow of current. Which of the following is a resonant or tuned circuit? An inductor and a capacitor connected in series and parallel to form a filter. Which of the following is a common reason to use shielded wire to prevent coupling of unwanted signals to or from the wire? So think shielding and preventing. Shielded wire prevents coupling of unwanted signals to or from the wire. And for coupling, you can think like a prevent one signal from affecting another. Right. Oh man, my mouse is stuck. Hold up. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, is that it? Okay, that's actually the end of the section. My mouse is not stuck. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions about that before we go on break? Could you go back to T6D2? T6D2, sure thing. Let me uh, scroll back over there. T6, 
B2. What is a relay? A relay is an electrically controlled switch. Is there a um, diagram for that, like in a comp as a component? Uh, I don't think it's going to be tested, but we can Google that real quick. Am I still sharing my screen here? Yes. All right. Relay. <laughs> it's showing the uh, the presentation. Oh no, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> All right, we're going on a lag. going on a trip to Google. Going on a going on an adventure. Yes. Actually, I don't know if it's here. Uh, that's a at the normal switch. That's a relay coil. It's not quite what we're looking for. Ah, there we are. That's a electromagnetic relay generic symbol. Here's another one. Uh, sometimes you'll see this. So, kind of when you put a signal into this little thing right here, it'll go back and forth. But that's not going to be on the test. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so we'll come back at uh, 150 and do T7. All righty. See you guys in about 10 minutes. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, could you go back to uh, T6D? I think it's four or six. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, T6. What was the D? Uh, I think it's. Oh. I think it's four, actually. Wait, uh, five? Five. D5, this one? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. What type of circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? That's a regulator. So think controlling is regulating. And, and could you go to uh, eight as well? Sure thing. Let's go to eight. Which of the following is combined with an inductor to make a tuned circuit, a capacitor? Got it. Thank you very much. No problem. Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna turn off the radio because that's gonna be distracting. All right, uh, can everyone hear me fine? Yes. Yeah. Okay. By the way, the recording is starting again for the those that are here. Just wanted to let you know. Okay. So yes. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ethan KN6FIW. Um, and we are, you can see we are doing uh, sub elements T7, so SEC station equipment. Um, and uh, yeah, I, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know and I can adjust um, and feel free to speak out and I will have the chat open as well. Okay. Um, okay, which term describes the ability of a receiver to detect the presence of a signal? The answer is sensitivity. And a transceiver is a unit combining the functions of a transmitter and receiver, hence the name transceiver. Um, which of the following is used to convert a radio signal from one frequency to another? Mixer. So mixer is used to convert a radio signal from one frequency to another. And the term that describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals is selectivity. So able to select what signal you want to receive. The name of a circuit that generates a frequency at a, a signal at a specific frequency is called an oscillator.
the device that converts the RF input and output of a transceiver to another band is called a transverter. Okay. And PTT stands for push to talk um, and it switches between receive and transmit. PTT is push to talk. And the, okay. The following circuit combines a speech signal and RF carrier modulation. A modulation circuit combines a speech signal and an RF carrier. The function of the SSB slash CW FM switch on a VHF power amplifier is to set the amplifier for proper operation in the selected mode. So you're selecting between the SSB mode and the CW-FM mode. The device that increases the low power output from a handheld transceiver is called an RF power amplifier. An RF preamplifier is installed between the antenna and the receiver. So it is an amplifier before the receiver, hence the name preamplifier. And what can you do if you are told your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over deviating, talk further away from the microphone. What would cause a broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintentionally? Um, the answer is the receiver is unable to reject strong signals outside the AM or FM band. Yes, I will go a little bit slower. So uh, yeah, if you're unable to reject reject strong signals outside the AM or FM band, um, then uh, if you're like in your car and it's not, it's not able to reject signals outside the, like the broadcast AM or FM band, then you could potentially receive an amateur radio transmission. Which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? All of the above. Which of the following is a way to reduce or eliminate interference from an amateur transmitter to a nearby telephone? Um, put an RF filter on the telephone. Um, so that way you just uh, you're, I guess the idea is you're blocking RF on the telephone line and just getting voice or whatever you want to hear. So put an RF filter on the telephone. Overload of a non-amateur radio or TV receiver by an amateur signal can be reduced or eliminated by blocking the amateur signal with a filter at the antenna input of the affected receiver. So if you had a TV or a radio um, that's receiving amateur radio signals, then you can, you can block the amateur signals with the filter at the input of your TV or other radio. Okay. If a neighbor tells you that your station's transmissions are interfering with their radio or TV reception, uh, as a ham operator, your responsibility is to make sure that your station is functioning properly and that it does not cause interference to your own radio or television when it is tuned to the same channel. So basically just check your own amateur radio equipment with your own TV or radio, 
um, tuned to the same channel and um, that will allow you to uh, diagnose the problem uh, with your own equipment, with your station. Which of the following can reduce overload to, an, to a VHF transceiver from a nearby FM broadcast station, a band reject filter? So you can block out the signals from the FM broadcast station. You're rejecting your you have a filter that gets lowers, attenuates the the signals from the FM broadcast station. So that's a band reject filter. What should you do if something in your neighbor's in a neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur station? All of the above. A part 15 device is an unlicensed device that may emit low power radio signals on frequencies used by a licensed service. So part 15 is an unlicensed device that may emit low power radio signals on frequencies used by a licensed service. What's an example of that? Okay, so just based on this description, maybe like, uh, you know those things you could plug into like cigarette lighters and you can like get your phone hooked up to your car if you don't have like a, a cable or something like that. So basically what the, the unit that has a Bluetooth receiver uh, plugs into your car, you're transmitting on the FM band, which is like uh, a broadcast, like the FM broadcast band. So that way your car can get the audio, um, but it's low powered. And so like, hopefully other people outside your car can also hear what you're, you're uh, transmitting from that little receiver. But um, yeah, the idea is it's low powered. Um, that way you're not causing harmful interference to licensed radio service like actual FM broadcast stations like uh, KCPR or something like that. I don't know. Cool. Um, what might be a problem if you receive a report that your audio signal through the repeater is distorted or unintelligible, all of the above? What's a symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or receiver? Reports of garbled, distorted, or unintelligible voice transmissions. What should be the first step to resolve cable TV interference from your ham radio transmissions? Be sure all TV coaxial connectors on are installed properly. Um, so I guess we don't have a coax. This is coax, but yes, if your if your cables are not installed correctly, maybe it's loose or something. Uh, then one end is not connected, is not grounded, I guess, and so uh, you could be getting. Uh, you could be, this is kind of like a previous question or a previous question that we had um, when you're receiving other broadcast stations on your, on your ham radio, um, except this one is uh, the solution for this. Or your first step is making sure that all TV coaxial connectors are installed properly. The primary purpose of a dummy load is to prevent transmitting signals over the air when making tests. We have a dummy load. Oh, yeah. This is the cool thing about being in the shack. Okay, so this is a dummy load. It's basically like a fat piece of metal with um, 
like a coaxial connector connected to it. And so if I wanted to, sorry, if I wanted to make sure that, um, if I wanted to test a radio and I didn't want to transmit over the air um, for whatever reason, maybe it's just because I'd be blasting like a bunch of radio RF like into the air for no reason at all, just to test my equipment. Then you basically transmit into a dummy load and all your power will be kind of dissipated into the dummy load instead of being sent to an antenna and it uh, resonates. So this is one example. Uh, this is metal. Um, sometimes you'll see dummy loads in like a can of oil. Um, they can be, they're like rated for different, uh, different wattages, so different amounts of power. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a dummy load. Just gets hot when you send uh, RF through it. Okay. Which of the following instruments can be used to determine if an antenna is resonant at the desired operating frequency and antenna analyzer? So, actually, we might have it. Never mind. I don't know where. It oh. Never mind. Sorry, I can't find one. Oh, I would if I knew where it was. But yeah, an antenna analyzer tells you if it's resonant at the desired operating frequency. Okay, what in general terms is the standing wave ratio, SWR? Uh, it is a measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line. And so this is one of the things that an antenna will tell you, or an, an antenna analyzer will tell you, is the SWR. Uh, what is what is what reading on an SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance match between the antenna and feed line uh, one to one? So all your actually sorry I was incorrect about the antenna analyzer. It doesn't measure SWR. I don't think. Well, I don't know. SWR is like um, yeah, like the ratio of if you're getting all the power that you're transmitting is being sent out to the antenna and you're not losing any to the feed line. So one-to-one -one is like 100% is going out. So that's a perfect impedance match. Why do most solid state amateur radio transmitters reduce output power as SWR increases uh, to protect the power amplifier, amplifier transistors? And so, yeah, as SWR increases, you'll get uh, more uh, the power that you're sending out to the antenna. Um, it'll be lost. It'll be actually like reflected back. And so it's to protect that kind of like the power that's heading back to the output amplifier. And so you can reduce as SWR increases, you re, um, solid state amateur radio transmitters will decrease the output power uh, to protect the amplifier, which is the output amplifier, which is sending out the power. And SWR reading of four to one indicates an impedance mismatch. So basically you're not getting all the, all the, all the RF that you're sending out um, is not all being transmitted down the line. Impedance mismatch. What happens to power loss in the feed line? It is converted into heat. What instrument other than an SWR meter could you use to determine if a feed line and antenna are properly matched? A directional watt meter. Um, so yeah, you could see how much power is being sent out if you're getting any that's reflected. So you could make sure that all the power that you're sending out to your feed line and antenna. So like you have your amplifier, your feed line, and then your antenna, all the power that you're sending out of your amplifier is being absorbed or being dissipated through the antenna. 
and p minus x. Um, which of the following is the most common cause for failure of coaxial cables, uh, moisture contamination? So basically, uh, yeah, if you leave cables out and they get moist, um, you have oxidation. And so uh, basically like corrosion of uh, the conductors and that will, uh, it'll just tear down or uh, break down the, the metal that the coaxial, is, coaxial cable is made of. And uh, yeah, you won't get the, the performance out of it that it originally was. Um, and yeah, if it's really bad, then you won't get anything. It will just be strands of metal, but it'd be uh, all worn down. So moisture contamination is the most common cause for failure of coaxial cables. Why should the outer jacket of coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? And ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, if you have like a radio set up outside, uh, kind of permanently, I guess, like, um, I don't know what's a good example. Like, I don't know, you leave plastic outside, it gets, it gets damaged, kind of the same idea by the sun, which is very powerful. And then eventually it'll wear down and uh, the outer layers of insulation uh, could be, could start to break and allow moisture to get into the cable. So um, that's why it's important uh, because ultraviolet can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. A disadvantage of air core coaxial cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types is that it requires special techniques to prevent water absorption. Um, yeah, so basically coaxial cable, you have a metal like inside and then you have like an outside and in between there's either, you have some kind of insulator, either air, foam or a solid dielectric. And so if you have air in there, um, yeah, you have to be really careful because um, as if the temperature changes or the pressure changes, uh, you could get condensation inside the cable, which is not good. And so, um, yeah, obviously it's not good because if you have water moisture in there, then go back to the uh, oxidation and it, the whole thing kind of degrading. And so, yeah, air core coaxial cable requires special techniques to prevent water absorption. What does a dummy load consist of? A non-inductive reheat resistor and a heat sink. So here's our dummy load, a resistor and a heat sink. Most of the stuff you see is the heat sink. All these fins help to dissipate the heat. Block of metal. All right, what instrument would you use to measure electric potential or electromotive force? And that is a voltmeter. Uh, volts are the units of electric potential. What is the correct way to connect a voltmeter to a circuit in parallel with the circuit? Um, yeah, so you're measuring the difference in electric potential between two points. And so you have your voltmeter in parallel with the circuit. How is a simple ammeter connected to a circuit uh, in series with the circuit? So an ammeter measures current, uh, flowing through through the circuit. And so uh, in series, if you have a component here and a component here, you wanna have it in series so it can measure the amount of current that's passing through. <laughs> I can see you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, did I just pass this? 
Uh, okay. And yeah, we just talked about what instrument is used to measure electric current in ammeter. Uh, what instrument is used to measure resistance in ohm meter? Uh, ohms are the units of resistance. Uh, which of the following might damage a multimeter? Attempting to use, attempting to measure voltage when using the resistance setting. Uh, yeah, this is just how it's wired up. You can damage a multimeter by measuring voltage when using the resistance setting. What do the following measurements are commonly made using a multimeter? Voltage and resistance. Which of the following types of solder is best for radio and electric use? Rosin core solder. Um, so solder is basically usually like a tin based or a lead based um, uh, metal that uh, when you heat it up, it turns into liquid and uh, inside um, inside ros rosin core solder is basically you have like a, like a string of solder and on the end or inside the solder, there's like, uh, there's rosin. And so that's kind of like, if you've ever soldered stuff before, it's that forming the, the smoke that like comes out when you first heat it up and uh, yeah, that helps to uh, protect the connections from oxidizing um, because when you heat it up, it accelerates that um, the oxidation process. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great for radio electronic use because um, kind of the that's like the best way of applying uh, rosin or yeah, some kind of some kind of material that can help slow down or prevent oxidation when you're soldering is to have it built into the solder. So rosin core solder for radio and electro electronic use. What is the characteristic appearance of a cold solder joint? It's a grainy or dull surface. A cold solder joint, as the name implies, is basically uh, when you try to solder uh, when you're trying to solder a connection and uh, you don't get it hot enough, um, it will have a grainy or dull surface. So this is not good. Um, you want a shiny surface, but a cold solder joint appears grainy or dull. What well, is probably happening when an ohm meter connected across an unpowered circuit initially indicates a low resistance and then shows increasing resistance with time, the circuit contains a large capacitor. Um, yeah, basically how an ohm meter works is you, I think it sends a little bit of voltage across the circuit and then it uses that to figure out um, and it, it knows the current as well. And so you can use Ohm's law, which if you haven't learned, you'll learn uh, soon and you can calculate the resistance. But if you keep on uh, sending a current through the circuit, then it could charge the capacitor, which will result in uh, a greater, uh, it'll, the, the ohm meter will indicate uh, increasing resistance with time. And so, yeah, if the circuit contains a large capacitor, um, that's uh, what you can get. Which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring circuit resistance with an ohm meter? Um, you should ensure that the circuit is not powered. Um, yeah, this is to protect primarily the ohm meter. Um, uh, remember, one of the questions that we we did a while ago, talked about uh, how you want to be careful uh, not to try to measure voltage within ohm meter. And so 
uh, you want to use, uh, you want to measure uh, circuit resistance on an unpowered circuit. Uh, that way you don't damage the equipment. Which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring high voltages with the voltmeter? Ensure that the voltmeter and leads are rated for use at the voltages to be measured. Um, yes, high voltages. Uh, you could yeah, damage your equipment. You could get magic smoke coming out of it if you are if you try to uh, yeah, use a voltmeter any kind of equipment for something that it's not rated for. So yeah, when you're measuring high voltages, um, ensure that the voltmeter and leads are rated for use at the voltages to be measured. And this is usually written on the, the leads, so like the probes um, or uh, like kind of the front panel of the voltmeter where you plug, where you plug stuff in, it tells you uh, what it's rated for. And that's it. Any questions? Anything? Can you, go, can you go back to C2 and C3? C2 and C3. C2. Thank you. Yep. All right. C2. And C3. Did you go back, back to, to AO2? Go back to C2? AO2. AO2. Okay. Was there somebody else who said something too? Yeah, uh, I'll do it after this. Okay. A O two. Uh, could you go to B6? Any other slides? I think we have a 10 minute break, right, Helen? Or something like that? Okay. So, yeah, we'll be back at uh, 2 32, I guess. And uh, yeah, we can stand up and stretch and get a drink of water. And uh, yeah, I'll just be hanging out. Oh. We got other dummy loads here. I'm curious. This is a 10 watt dry dummy load. So there's like no oil in here. I'm not sure what's in here, honestly. Probably just a bunch of metal. Yeah, so you can fire 10 watts through this and it'll absorb it. This is a 15 watt dummy load. It has a bunch of fins on it and then you plug in the connector over here. And then this thing, you can actually hear the, the oil in here. Yeah. 
This is a 50 watt dummy load. Um, they call it a coaxial resistor because that's basically what it does, right? A resistor plus a, plus a heat sink. And so, um, yeah, same thing here. Just a bunch of oil that's been sealed for ages that you can just blast stuff through. Okay. Awesome. All right. Okay, now we move on to T8. We're almost there. Or we're almost done. Uh, yeah, this one is on uh, modulation modes, amateur satellite operation, operating activities, non-voice and digital communications. Um, so uh, let's dive in. All right, and sorry, one second, let me pull up the chat. All right, okay. Uh, which of the following is a form of amplitude modulation? Single sideband, single sideband, also known as SSB, is a form of amplitude modulation. Which type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF packet radio transmissions? FM, FM for VHF packet radio transmissions. Which type of voice mode is most often used for long distance weak signal contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? Uh, SSB, single side band. Voice mode most often used for long distance weak signal contacts on VHF and UHF. Which type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeaters? Uh, this is FM, frequency modulation. And the following types of mode, the following mode, uh, which of the following types of emission has the narrowest bandwidth? CW. Which sideband is normally used for five, a 10 meter HF, VHF, and UHF single sideband communications? Upper sideband. Upper side band. Maybe you can remember this is for HF, VHF, and UHF. And since it's UHF, you have U and upper, upper side band. 
What is an advantage of single sideband SSB over FM for voice transmissions is that SSB signals have a narrower bandwidth than FM. So uh, SSB signals have narrower bandwidth, bandwidth than FM. The approximate bandwidth of a single sideband voice signal is three kilohertz. Three kilohertz for SSB. Lowercase k. Yeah, lowercase k. Okay. Uh, the approximate bandwidth of a UHF or VHF, sorry, what is the approximate bandwidth of a VHF FM repeater FM voice phone signal, also voice signal, um, between 10 and 15 kilohertz? Uh, the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM phone signal is between 10 and 15 kilohertz. What is the typical bandwidth of analog fast scan TV transmissions on the 70 centimeter band? About six megahertz. The approximate minimum, maximum, the approximate maximum bandwidth required to transmit a CW signal is 150 hertz. And remember CW, uh, requires the least bandwidth, so 150 hertz. Um, what telemetry information is typically transmitted by satellite beacons? Health and status of the satellite. So probably like the battery level, I don't know, other telemetry related information uh yeah okay what is the impact of using too much effective radiated power on a satellite uplink um this is blocking access by other users i guess it'd be blocking access to other users yes and the general like best practices of ham radio is to use the least amount of power that you need to make a successful transmission. Um, that way, if there's other people who want to talk uh, at lower powers, they can't. And so that way, uh, yeah, we aren't just all blasting everyone with a bunch of power um, and preventing other people from talking. Which of the following are provided by satellite tracking programs? All of the above, all of the following choices are correct. A satellite beacon is a transmission from a satellite that contains status information. So I think we had a similar question to this before. Status information contains telemetry, stuff like that. Um, which of the following are inputs to a satellite tracking program? The Keplerian elements, Kepler, Keplerian elements. With regard to satellite communications, what is Doppler shift? Um, Doppler shift is an observed change in signal in signal frequency caused by relative motion between the satellite and the Earth station. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with Doppler, or by observing the change in signal frequency. The change in frequency, um, you tell like speed, and yeah. Basically, basically, yeah, relative, relative velocity, relative motion. 
What is meant by the statement that a satellite is operating in mode UV? Um, this means that the satellite uplink is in the 70 centimeter band, uh, also known as UHF, and the downlink is in the two meter band, also known as VHF. So this is why it's called UV for UHF uplink, VHF downlink, uplink is in the 70 centimeter band, and the downlink is in the two meter band. And uh, yeah, okay. What causes spin fading of satellite signals? Rotation of the satellite and its antennas. So as you, yeah, as the satellite spins, um, you want your receiver and your transmitter antenna to be at the same orientation, but if you spin, like if this is like, if they're like cross like this, then you're gonna have loss because the, the wave isn't uh, hitting the receiver at the same angle that it's being transmitted at. And so rotation causes spin fading of satellite signals. What do the initials LEO tell you about an amateur satellite? The satellite is in a low Earth orbit. LEO, low Earth orbit. Who may receive telemetry from a space station? Anyone who can receive the telemetry signal. So, I'm surprised we haven't tried this, honestly, but uh, if you're curious to knowing how the Polysat satellites are doing, you can just build an antenna and point it at the sky and see how they're doing. Uh, yes, yeah, so anyone who can receive the telemetry signal can receive telemetry. Which of the following is a good way to judge whether your uplink power is neither too low nor too high? and your strength, signal strength on the downlink should be about the same as the beacon. Which of the following methods is used to locate sources of radio interference or jamming? Radio direction finding. Um, this is actually really interesting. The, uh, so if you are, I don't know, if you are having, if you're causing interference to like a license service, say, I don't know, an FM broadcast station, they want to figure out who this rogue DJ, like the F, the FCC wants to figure out who the rogue DJ is. They got really nice directional antennas and they will find you. So don't mess with the FCC, especially if it's like, I don't know. Yeah, just don't mess with the FCC. Don't mess with the feds. Good advice, Kevin. Don't mess with the feds. Don't mess with the feds. Don't do it. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, which of these items would be useful for a hidden transmitter hunt? A directional antenna. Okay, wait, I got that. Up oh, here we here we go. Oh, uh, see, we have like a tank. We have like this rack that has all these things, and every time you try to grab one, it always falls down. This is a. It's known as a yagi, Y A G I, but uh, these are directional antennas that we use for our transmitter hunts. Uh, plug our Sea uh, Park events and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, basically. Uh, just PVC and measuring tape and you plug in this cable or plug in to a radio and then you can, you can locate hidden transmitters on Cal Poly's campus or something like that with uh, a directional antenna. Uh, which operating activity involves contacting as many stations as possible during a specified period? This is called contesting. You are contesting 
to see you are in a contest to see how many stations you can contact during a specified period. Which of the following is good procedure when contacting another station in a radio contact, radio contest? Send only the minimum amount of information needed for proper identification and the context, contest exchange. So usually uh, what a contest is like is you have a bunch of people kind of shouting, well, shouting, whatever, on the radio, and they're all competing to, to hear someone's Here's someone's call sign. So that would be like identification. And then usually there's something like, oh, what, what kind of station are you operating? Um, and what's your location? And so um, usually something like that, you just do a really quick exchange and then you're off to talk to someone else. So uh, that's contacting, just sending the minimum information needed for proper identification and the contact, contest exchange. What is a grid locator? A grid locator is a number letter designated designator assigned to a geographic location. Um, grid is really cool. Grid locators are really cool. They're not, I guess they can be as precise as you want them to be, but yeah, these are one of the, one of the uh, information things that you might share with other people when you're going, doing a contest is uh, your grid locator. How is access to some IRLP nodes accomplished uh, by using DTMF signals? Um, so a lot of acronyms here. IRLP is the Internet Repeater Linking Protocol, I think. And so uh, basically, uh, uh, sometimes you might have, you might have a repeater, uh, that's connected to the internet somehow. And so, uh, by sending DTMF, which is like the tones, okay. Like, I don't know, you know, like on a, on a phone, like where you, like, you just like send these tones, right. And then you can get access to the IRLP notes. What is meant by voice over internet protocol, VOIP, VOIP, as used in amateur radio? And this is a method of delivering voice communications over the internet using digital techniques. So VOIP, voice over internet protocol, is literally voice communications over the internet using digital techniques. Obviously, you're sending data over the internet. It's it's going to be digital. What is the Internet Radio Linking Project? IRLP. Okay. I guess I was wrong with that acronym, but I was close. Uh, it is a technique used to connect amateur radio station systems, such as repeaters, via the Internet using voiceover Internet protocol. So... IRLP, Internet Radio Linking Projects, connects amateur radio station systems such as repeaters via the internet using voice over internet protocol. How might you obtain a list of active nodes that use voice over internet protocol? All of the following choices are correct. There are many ways to get a list of active nodes. What must be done before you may use the Echolink system to communicate using a repeater? You must register your call sign and provide proof of license. And Echolink is like another service that allows you to communicate with distant uh, radio repeaters, uh, other ham users over the internet. What is What name is given to an amateur radio station that is used to connect other amateur stations to the internet? Uh, this is called a gateway. Gateway to the internet. 
Which of the following is a digital communications mode? All of the all of these choices are correct. Many, many digital communications modes in use today. I have a question. Yeah. So basically anytime it gives like an all these choices are correct, is that what we should pick? Yes. Okay. I think there's yeah. I think there's some exceptions, but if you're if you're looking at a question and you have like oh, no oh, idea, you you mean like oh is there a situation where you it has all the choices incorrect and you wouldn't choose it? Uh yeah, there are a couple. Most of them are all of the above. I don't know why. Uh, but if you don't use that, don't like always just click all these choices are correct. Um, but um, if you're staring at a question and your brain is completely blank, uh, that's a good option to go for. Okay, thank you. What does the term APRS mean? Automatic Packet Reporting System. APRS, Automatic, automatic Packet Reporting System. Which of the following devices is used to provide data to the transmitter when sending automatic position reports from a mobile amateur radio station, a global positioning system receiver? Uh, so yeah, keyword is position uh, and you get that by having a GPS receiver. Which of the which type of transmission is indicated by the term NTSC? Um, this is an analog fast scan color TV signal. Analog fast scan color TV signal. Which of the following is an application of APRS, the automatic packet reporting system? Um, this is providing real-time tactical digital communications in conjunction with a map showing the location of station. So this is basically like, uh, I don't know, find my friends or whatever, whatever you people use today to stalk your friends, uh, except it's with radio. Like if you're, I just, just kidding. I, I don't know what people use. I don't want to judge, but I don't know. Like basically APRS, you can have a radio like this Say you're going hiking or something like that, or uh, I don't know, going on a road trip somewhere. Um, yeah, you or like if we're like having like uh, like a marathon or a bike race, and you want to figure out where your radio operators are at, uh, that's what APRS is for. Um, is providing real time tactical communications. So yeah, the key word is location. Um, that's usually the kind of information that you'll be passing through uh, with APRS. It's the most common. Uh, what does the abbreviation PSK mean? Uh, phase shift keying. He's unmuted. I don't know if you know you're unmuted. Yes, you check. Uh, yeah, PSK, phase shift keying. Uh, which of the following best describes DMR, digital mobile radio or digital migration radio? Uh, DMR is a technique for time multiplexing two digital voice signals on a single 12.5 uh, kilohertz repeater channel. So. There's a lot of stuff here, but uh, time multiplexing basically means, uh, say we, like you're looking at like the X axis is time, right? And you can have two voice signals that each take turns transmitting. So it's like an elaborate dance or a song, I guess would be a more apt metaphor, but they each take turns transmitting and receiving that way. You can have two people having a conversation at the same time. And uh, 12.5 kilohertz uh, refers to uh, the bandwidth 
of the repeater channel. So earlier we talked about how like the maximum bandwidth required for CW is 150 Hertz. Um, and SS, we talked about SSB and FM. Uh, and so with this, you're having a single 12.5 kilohertz repeater channel. And then you can like rotate this into the time domain and then you each take turns uh, sending whatever you need to do. So that is DMR, um, two voice signals on a single 12.5 kilohertz repeater channel. Which of the following may be included in packet transmissions? All of these choices are correct. Uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of different information you can pass uh, through packet transmissions. What code is used when sending CW in the amateur bands? International Morse. Uh, yeah, so CW uh, stands for continuous wave. Um, yeah, when you think of Morse code, like our, our repeater will broadcast our identifier, uh, W6BHZ, occasionally, and that, that will be in uh, Morse code, but uh, that's basically what uh, international Morse is, just the, the convention of the language that we are sending through uh, when we're using the CW mode. Which of the following operating activities is supported by digital mode software in the WSJT suite? All of these choices are correct. Just gotta memorize this one. All the, all the choices are for, correct for digital mode software in the WSJT suite. What is an ARQ transmission system? Uh, this is a digital scheme whereby the receiving station detects errors and sends a request to the sending station to retransmit the information. It's ARQ. Which of the following best describes broadband hamnet, also referred to as a high-speed multimedia network? Um, so broadband hamnet is an amateur radio-based data network using commercial Wi-Fi gear with modified firmware. So yes, there's a certain part of the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi like spectrum. So like channels that are um, set aside for Wi-Fi, frequency ranges that are set aside for Wi-Fi, um, you can use uh, I guess off the shelf kind of Wi Fi gear and uh, communicate on certain uh, certain segments of that that spectrum uh, using a broadband hamnet. What is FT8? Uh, FD8 is a digital mode capable of operating in low signal to noise conditions that transmits on 15 second intervals. So uh, low signal to noise conditions. So basically uh, like bad conditions. That's like if you, if there's a lot of noise in your signal and you're trying to pick out, pick out the, the actual signal, the transmission, uh, then FT8 is a digital mode. And so maybe it might not, it might not be possible to understand what somebody is saying if they're using like an analog mode, like FM or SSB, um, but digital mode, digital modes um, are obviously not interpreted by us humans, but by a computer. And so you have a greater ability to pull out weak signals uh, in the noise. And so that's what FT8 is. What is an electronic keyer? Uh, this is a device that assists in manual sending of Morse code. Do we have an electronic keyer? It's 
So yes. Now, electronic keyer is a device that assists in manual sending of Morse code. And that is it. Wow, you're just in time. All right, uh, any questions? Anything you want me to go back to? I see a hand raise. You can you have my some, to speak. I've got some decently spread out ones. But yeah. yes, can I get uh, B5, C10, and D11? All right, I'll go backwards. So ARQ. Yeah. A digital scheme where the receiving station detects errors and sends a request to the sending station to retransmit the information. Okay. Got it, thanks. Cool. And then the next one was C10. Cool. And also, uh, this might help you remember it. it. ARQ stands for Automatic Repeat Request or Automatic Repeat Query. So uh, yes, if, it, if you don't, if the computer doesn't understand the digital signal that's receiving, then it'll ask it to repeat to retransmit the information. All right, uh, what was the next one uh, in the D section? It was a C10. Oh, C10. Okay. Oh, I can spin the wheel. That's cool. Okay. C10. C10. What must be done before you may use the echo link system to communicate using a repeater is you must register your call sign and provide proof of license. So this is Echolink is an internet system uh, used to connect different radios. And so the Echolink, the people over at Echolink, uh, you need to have show proof of your call sign. So that way you're, they know you're an amateur operator because um, you'll be, your signal will eventually be transmitted out on a repeater on the amateur radio bands. Cool, thanks. And then um, I had BO5 and then Shane in the chat just said B4. Okay. Okay. A satellite beacon is a transmission from a satellite that contains status information. Thanks. Oh, what the good? What happened to BO4? That's interesting. I didn't do it. Uh, <clears throat> what is it? I'm gonna look it up right now. Oh, is it, is it is it missing? Yeah, so oh, this well. is uh, T8 BO4. So um oops one second i will pull up actually okay, this wait. is a good chance someone here had a good question for me um they asked where can we find these slides that we have i would actually recommend using ham study and i'll go ahead and share yes. my screen here so you can see what that looks like i'll kind of show you around what that is Okay, so this is a ham study and I'll drop this link right in the chat. All right, and these are the exact same questions that we have in the presentation. Um, but yeah, so say you wanted to look up the one that we're missing, uh, which is sub element. So that's kind of like the bigger suction sub element T8. Um, and then this was B4 was that right, you could go to B. And then one. Okay. One, two, no, one, two, three, four. Okay, so you can kind of see that's where it is. So again, if you want to review the questions again, I'd recommend using ham study. 
And this particular question is, what mode of transmission is commonly used by amateur radio satellites? All of the above. <laughs> cool, thanks, Helen. Okie doke. Uh, any more questions? Cool, are we breaking until 15 or 10 after? 15 after? Uh, we could do 15, 15, 15. Cool, good, very Helen. Aesthetic. Very nice, yes. I guess the more aesthetic would be 15, 51, but uh, I have a, okay, you guys can, we can stop the recording. I, all right, so we're breaking. All right, the recording has started again. And I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, sub-element T9, antennas and feed lines. I love this stuff. <laughs> okay, first question. Uh, what is a beam antenna? This is an antenna that connects, uh, sorry, that concentrates signal in one direction. So things like a laser beam, right? Just goes in one direction. Which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? Inserting an inductor into the radiating portion of an antenna to make it electrically longer. So an inductor is, if you remember from a few sub-elements ago, it's a coiled piece of wire. So you just coil your, uh, coil your antenna <laughs> and that makes it electrically longer or makes it steam longer than it physically is. Which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to the Earth's surface? So like that, right? A horizontally polarized antenna. So think parallel to the Earth's surface is horizontal. What is a disadvantage of the rubber duck antenna supplied with most handheld radio transceivers when compared to a full-size quarter wave antenna? It does not transmit or receive as effectively. So that is the drawback. For those of you uh, wondering, this is a rubber duck antenna attached to my handheld radio right here. Um, it is very short. If it were to be a quarter wave antenna, it would be much, much longer. And while that is more efficient, it is not <laughs> very practical to carry around sometimes. So, uh, yep, the rubber duck antenna. It's shorter, but it's not as efficient. How will you change a dipole antenna to make it resonant on a higher frequency? You shorten the antenna, so you physically cut down the antenna. <laughs> Higher frequency, shorter wavelength. You shorten the antenna. What type of antenna are quad, yagi, and dish antennas? These are all directional antennas. They work very well in one direction and not very well in the opposite. Sometimes, depends on the type of antenna. They're directional. The rubber duck antennas that we have here are sort of meant to receive in generally any direction, but um, Yagi, quad, and dish antennas work better in one particular direction or sometimes do. <laughs> what is a disadvantage of using handheld VHF transceiver with its integral antenna integral? <laughs> inside a vehicle. All right, if you're using an antenna inside a vehicle, signals might not propagate well due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. So what this means is your radio waves can't get through metal. So if you're in a metal box, it's not going to go out very well. Uh, yep. So signals might not propagate well due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. Shielding is just like blocking.
what is the approximate length in inches of a quarter wavelength vertical antenna for 146 megahertz? 19 inches. So for this one, my tip is just look for the smaller number, but not the smallest. <laughs> so there should be another answer that's like 12 inches or something. Just go one up from that. And remember that it's 19. You could also kind of do the math for this, but honestly, it's kind of tedious. Like you could do, let's see, what's the equation here? Um, put the, annotate. All right, so you could do the, the equation. Uh, so let's see, uh, wavelength equals the speed of light over the frequency. And then since you want a quarter, you could divide this. Oh, hi there. Uh, I'm still presenting during the ham cram, so I'm going to jump back over to that room if that's okay. I'll be right back uh, once the session starts. <laughs> okay, well, that was awkward. Um, <laughs> they just moved me over to another breakout room. Did they, did for, they yeah. send you, did they send yeah. you, to, did they send you to Palace? They, they did indeed. <laughs> they okay. sent me into an exam room, but uh, I'm presenting. So uh, let me share my screen again, and we will continue off with what we we're doing. Uh, but anyway, okay. uh, I shared the equation with you guys, but it's probably a lot easier just to memorize that it is 19. But if you wanted to, you could use the equation. So wavelength is the speed of light over frequency, and then divide it by 4 because it is the wavelength. But just remember, it's low but not the lowest. <laughs> All right, now the next one, this is uh, kind of related. What is the approximate length in inches of a half wavelength six meter dipole antenna? That is 112 inches. Okay, and am I still recording? Yes, I think I am. Okay, awesome. Um, and for this one, just remember it is a large number, but not the largest. So there's another one, I think it's like 300 or 200 or something. Just pick the one that's like one less than that. <laughs> so 112, or you could use the equation again. I forgot to mention that you would also need to convert two inches if you're going to do uh, 300 meters per second. Or <laughs> yeah, if you're, you know, yeah, just make sure that you uh, convert to inches if you are using the equation. Or just remember that it is Large, but not the largest. All right. In which direction does a half-wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? That is broadside to the antenna. And if you're wondering, broadside is basically, if your antenna looks like, if your dipole antenna looks like this, right? Dipole is two poles. Uh, broadside is like, where the plane lies going outwards like this. So if you were like, if your pen is like this, it would go that way. So in which direction does a half wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? Broadside to the antenna, like perpendicular to the plane that the antenna lies on. All right. What is the gain of an antenna? gain is the increase in signal strength in the specified direction compared to a reference antenna. Reference antenna is basically just like what you're comparing your antenna that you're testing to. Um, yeah, I think gain, stronger signal strength in a specific direction. All right, what is an advantage of using a properly mounted 5 8 wavelength antenna for a VHF or UHF mobile service? It has a lower radiation angle and more gain than a quarter wavelength antenna. I think if you have a lower radiation angle, like a smaller angle, it's more concentrated, more gain. Actually, I'm not sure if that's the correct allergy, but just think. Uh, Lower radiation angle, more gain, more concentrated. Why is it important to have low SWR, also known as standing wave ratio, when using coaxial cable feed line? 
to reduce signal loss. SWR or standing wave ratio is basically a measurement of how much power is being reflected back to your radio. So just uh, you want to have less power reflected to reduce losing your signal that you're transmitting. Yep, it is important to have low SWR to reduce uh, signal loss. What is the impedance of most coaxial cables to use in amateur radio installation? 50 ohms. This is just by convention. They all decided 50 ohms was a good number. So 50 ohms. Why is coaxial cable in most common feed line selected for amateur radio Amateur radio antenna systems, art. Coaxial cable is easy to use and requires few special installation considerations. So it's stuff that you can just buy straight off the shelf. Coaxial cable is easy to use. What is the major function of an antenna tuner, also known as an antenna coupler? It matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. Basically, it just makes sure that your your radio uh, and your sorry your antenna and your radio are matched and tuned to each other. Matching and tuning going on. All right. In general, what happens as the frequency of a signal passing through the coaxial cable is increased? Right. As you increase the frequency, the loss increases. Higher frequency, more loss. Which of the following connectors is most suitable for frequencies above 400 megahertz? Type N connector. Right, this one you just got to memorize, <laughs> but it's a type N connector. I think uh, N is after M for megahertz. Which of the following is true of PL259 type coax connectors? They are commonly used at HF or high frequency frequencies. Why should coax connectors exposed to weather be sealed against water intrusion? To prevent an increase in feed line loss. All right, talked about this earlier, but water is bad for coaxial cables. So uh, yeah, if you, if you have a lot of water and your cables are damaged, you're gonna have more line loss or just uh, less power reaches your antenna from your radio. So seal against water to prevent an increase in feed line loss. What can cause erratic changes in SWR readings? A loose connection in an antenna or feed line. Right, make sure your, uh, your connections are nice and tight, otherwise you will lose <laughs> what you're trying to transmit. Okay. What is the electrical difference between RG58 and RG8 coaxial cable? RG8 cable has less loss at a given frequency. For this one, you can think RG58 compared to RG8. RG8 has one less character and therefore less loss. That's not how it works, but it's just it's good mnemonic, I guess. RG8 cable has less loss at a given frequency. Okay, which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? Air insulated hard line. 
Okay, and I think that is the end of this uh, sub element. Any questions? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize there was so much stuff in there. Oh, that's just when I dropped out of the Zoom. Okay. All right, any questions? Okay, we've got uh, B7 already. Let's go back. B7. Which of the following is true of PL259 type coax connectors? PL259 coax connectors are commonly used at HF frequencies. Now, the interesting thing about this is high frequency in ham radio is actually like the lower <laughs> frequencies of the set that we use. Uh, you don't need to worry about that, but uh, yep. PL259 type connectors are commonly used at high frequencies. Any other questions? All right, awesome. If no other questions, then I think we'll be on break until 3.40. I'll see you all in um, 10 minutes. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started here with uh, T0. This is the final sub-element. Uh, we're going to be talking about FCC RF hazards, of which there are many. I'm just kidding. Radiation exposure, proximity to antennas, uh, recognized safe power levels, exposure to others, radiation types, and duty cycle. We'll explain what all those things mean. All right. Uh, question one. Which of the following is a safety hazard of a 12 volt storage battery? Shorting the terminals can cause burns, fire, or an explosion. Should be pretty straightforward. You don't want to short the terminals of a battery together. They will, uh, over very little, well, you can think of it. If you got a wrench or something, you short them together. It's got very little resistance. That's a lot of current going to flow, even with just 12 volts. So you don't want to short a battery together. It could explode, especially if it's a lithium battery. It will definitely explode. Okay, what health hazard is presented by electrical current flowing through the body? Uh, I don't have the other choices here, but they're probably very bad things. And so the one to that answer is all of these choices are correct. Uh, if it sounds for this question, if it sounds like a hazard and there's more than one, then all of these choices are correct, right? That's how you can gather the answer to that question. Okay, in the United States, what is connected to the green wire in a three wire electrical AC plug? That is the equipment ground, and you'll notice this if you ever take apart an electrical plug or do any electrical wiring in, uh, in a home, uh, that the green wire is the equipment ground, uh, or sometimes just the ground. What is the purpose of a fuse in an electrical circuit? Uh, the purpose of a fuse is to interrupt the power, aka to break the circuit open in case of a uh, overload. So it's not... Uh, so if the current is too much, the fuse, usually some sort of little piece of wire or something that's designed for a certain current, right? It'll melt and it'll interrupt the power in case the circuit is overloaded. So that's the purpose of the fuse. Uh, why is it unwise to uninstall uninst a 20 ampere fuse in place of a five amp fuse? Well, uh, excessive current could cause a fire. Um, so for example, if you have a, um, a, uh, a, a uh, five thing that's only drawing, you know, four amps and you have a five amp fuse, right? Uh, to protect against it, if you install one that's too big, if your load ends up, if your load ends up taking something say for, for 15 amps and you're, or if you're, if you end up drawing 20 amps and your wire in your system is only rated for 15, it could start a fire, it could melt. So yes, excessive current here could start a fire. So only, you always want to size uh, just above what you need, but not too much because you don't want to overload your uh, system. Okay, what is a good way to guard against electrical shock at your station? 
uh, all of these choices are correct. I assume the other choices are uh, uh, things that you can do to guard against electrical shock, probably include grounding and uh, other things. Which of these protect precautions should be taken for and when installing devices for lightning protection in a coaxial cable. Okay, you want to mount all of the protectors on a metal plate that is in turn connected to an external grounding rod so that all of the, the surge protectors have a path to ground that is not through your system, right? You want to mount them on some kind of metal plate connected to a ground, an external grounding rod. All right, what safety equipment should always be included in home-built equipment uh, that is powered from a 120 volt AC power circuits? Uh, a fuse or circuit breaker in series with the AC hot conductor. Okay, so the uh, AC hot conductor, right? There's three wires on uh, usually either two wires or three wires. There's the, uh, there's the, well, I, I wouldn't say hot or cold, but they're both hot. But the current is flowing through the hot one. You don't want to do it through the ground. Um, so yes, you would want to have a fuse in series, right? So that way, if something shorts uh, or there's too much current drawn, the circuit breaker trips up from your uh, system. And, uh, and then you don't have uh, that issue. So yeah, fuse or circuit breaker in series with the AC hot conductor especially when you're powered from 120 volts AC. Okay, what should be done to all external ground rods or earth connection? Bond them together with heavy wire or conductive strap. This is to have a very low resistance uh, ground, uh, tying all your grounds together so that they're all kind of tied to the same ground. Um, sometimes at even different places in the earth, even maybe 20, 30 feet away on a building can have highly different resistance and you want to make sure they're just all bonded together with some sort of wire, heavy wire, right? Which we know thicker wire has a lower resistance. So we learned earlier today or some sort of conductive strap, right? Okay, what can happen if a lead acid storage battery is charged or discharged too quickly? Yes, it could overheat and give off flammable gas in the case of lead acid batteries, uh, or it could just explode you don't want to charge or discharge too quickly. That's right. Um, just, you know, take it easy, slow it down. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you don't, if you don't do so, it will overheat. Uh, it could vent gas from the lead acid or it will explode. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. I mean, nothing, if you charge or discharge something too quickly, it's probably not going to be a good, so that, that, that can help you determine the answer to this question. Okay, what kind of hazard might exist in a power supply when it is turned off and disconnected? You might receive an electric shock from charge stored in large capacitors. Remember that charge capacitors uh, store electric charge. And they have the capacity, right, to store electric charge in an uh, electric field. And uh, that field remains uh, sometimes if they're connected to something and it doesn't have a path to discharge itself, right? and it might discharge through you. So that's why uh, power supplies, yeah, you might receive a shock from a power supply if there's a uh, charge in uh, large capacitors when you disconnect it. When should members of a tower team, wear work, tower work team wear a hard hat and safety glasses at all times when any work is being done on a tower? You don't wanna take any liberties here, just always, Air on the kind of safety at all times, you want to be wearing hard hat and safety glasses when you're working on a tower. Okay, what is a good precaution to observe before climbing an antenna tower? Put on a carefully inspected climbing harness, a fall arrestor, and safety glasses. This is to prevent you from perhaps falling off the tower, right? As, as noted by the words fall arrestor. Uh, and safety glasses to prevent you from uh, hitting anything, getting in your eyes or, or hitting yourself in the eyes, which would not be good. Um, so yes, you should, before, you should put on the harness before climbing the tower also. Yep. Okay. Under what circumstances uh, is it safe to climb a tower without a helper or observer? Never. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Don't, don't be a hero. Uh, you always want to have someone spotting you. Uh, 
you know, it's like, uh, uh, like climbing a rock, you know, rock climbing or, or lifting weights or something, you know, you always want to have someone there to, uh, if something goes wrong. Uh, yeah. Okay. Which of the following is a important safety precaution to observe when putting up an antenna tower? You want to look for and stay clear of any overhead electrical wires. That's a very big one because if you're putting up a tower, right, it's conductive metal antennas could, could fly into a power line and uh, that's a bad day, right? So don't, uh, you want to make sure the tower is clear uh, and clear of any overhead electrical wires. Should be fairly, fairly straightforward, right? All right, what is the purpose of a gin pole? It's a uh, piece that you might just have to remember this one, but actually, well, I mean a pole, right? What would you use a pole for if you're setting up in ham radio? Uh, and the most likely one is to lift tower sections or antennas, right? That's the purpose of a gin pole, but you can help remember this one. Uh, I don't know how gin ties into it at all, but uh, you can lift tower sections with a pole. Okay, what is the minimum safe distance from a power line to allow when installing an antenna? Enough so that if the antenna falls unexpectedly, no part of it can come closer than 10 feet to the power wires. If you imagine you had an antenna, right, and this thing falls over, you don't want the power wires to be right next to it, right? So uh, you got to have at least, at least uh, 10 feet in between your... Uh, your power wires here and uh that'll uh that's yeah you have to have yeah because you want it you don't want to you know you want extra width right if the tower does fall down yeah no part can come closer than 10 feet okay which of the following is an important safety rule to remember when using a crank up tower so this is one uh that's cranked up by hand uh, this type of tower must not be climbed unless it's fully retracted right on the ground, which means it can't uh, it can't uh, fall down anymore, uh, or a mechanical safety locking device has been installed. This one should be pretty straightforward, right? You think you got something that can go up and down uh, at will, and you'll want to lock it into place or make sure it's all the way down so that uh, there's no chance that it you know comes down while you're on it. What is considered to be a proper grounding method for a tower? Uh, separate eight foot long grounding rods for each tower leg bonded to the tower and each other. So this is, uh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, if you have each tower leg, usually four tower. I mean, this one you might just have to remember, but you know, each, yeah, each tower leg has grounding rods and they're all coming out like this. I'm not sure if this is relevant, but this is kind of what they're trying to say is then they're all kind of, they're all bonded to each other. And uh, yeah, this one, just remember that separate eight foot long grounding rods. Okay. Why should you avoid attaching an antenna to a utility pole? It's pretty straightforward. Antenna should not contact high voltage power lines, even though it might seem like, hey, a great free place to install an antenna right next to my power lines. Uh, it's, you know, you wouldn't want to do that because it could zap you the uh, power line and it'd be a bad day for you and everyone else. So yeah, the antenna should not contact high voltage power lines. That's why. You'd Okay, which of the following is true when installing uh, grounding conductors used for lightning protection? Sharp bends must be avoided. You want that. Uh, I believe there's a reason for it. It has to do something with when you have, uh, when you have uh, like lightning coming off a thing. I think it can actually arc off of the, the thing and you don't want, if it's too sharp a bend here, um, so you should you uh, i'm not sure if that's true or not but that's how you could remember this uh even if it isn't true that uh sharp bends should be avoided because the lightning could jump off uh, if the bends are not uh if it's not a, a straight enough uh path okay which of the following establishes the grounding requirements for an amateur radio tower antenna there's none really at the the ham level uh 
And so the, the, you, you will want to rely on local electrical codes, right? That's going to be the authority for uh, installing any type of thing, any type of radio tower um, and the grounding requirements will be there. So yes, local electrical codes, that's who you should refer to. Okay, which of the following is good practice when selling ground wires on a tower for lightning protection? You want to make uh, ensure that the connections are short and direct. Remember, we learned earlier that longer wires have more resistance, and we want a very low resistance path to ground. So we want as straight as possible, right? We want the kind of bird's eye path, or bird uh, as the crow flies, not bird's eye, as the crow. Yeah, kind of the most direct path, and uh, we want to make that sure that the connections are short, right? Because shorter, we know that shorter wires have lower resistance. Yes, short and direct when installing grounding wires. What is the purpose of a safety wire through a turnbuckle used to tension guidelines? Uh, this is to prevent loosening of the guy line from vibration. What type of radiation and VH are VHF and UHF radio signals? So radio waves and uh, yeah, radio waves are what's called non-ionizing radiation uh, as opposed to, so this is non-cancer causing radiation. Um, so no, you can't get it from uh, your 5G, your cell phone or anything. Um, but yes, VHF and UHF radio signals are non-ionizing as opposed to uh, ionizing radiation, which is like gamma rays from stars and the sun and stuff like that and, rate and isotopes and all that crazy stuff. Um, but yes, VHF, UHF is non-ionizing radiation. Which of the following frequencies has the lowest value for maximum permissible exposure limit? 50 megahertz. This one uh, is because the human body, you know, if you, this is like a function of, this is like uh, E, don't, don't, don't remember this, but this is like exposure, things you can be, ex how much exposure you can have, and then versus this versus the uh, frequency and uh, 50 megahertz is right where I think the human body is the most, all the fat and tissues and everything are most uh, vulnerable to being cooked, to being kind of microwaved, if you will. Uh, so you want to make sure that 50 megahertz uh, has the lowest uh, maximum permissible exposure limit. Uh, this one you might just have to memorize, but that's why. Uh, what is the maximum power level that an amateur radio station may use at VHF frequencies before an RF exposure evaluation is required? 50 watts uh, PEP, that's peak envelope power at the antenna. So yeah, at VHF, you can use up to 50 watts at the antenna without having to do a RF exposure evaluation. What factors affect the RF exposure of people near an amateur station antenna? Uh, it sounds like it's more than one. It's gonna be things like the power, you know, the antenna, how close they are, things like that. Uh, but all of those choices are correct. Uh, many, many factors, you can remember this one, many factors do affect the RF exposure of uh, people near the antenna. So that's all of them. I guess everything does affect it. The, or I guess that is true. Okay, why do exposure limits vary with frequency? The human body, like I just explained, the human body absorbs more RF energy at some frequencies than at others, right? We know at 50 megahertz is kind of the most, uh, but yes, it's kind of a function of frequency. Uh, yeah, human body absorbs more RF energy at some frequencies than at others. So that's why they're different with frequency. Okay. Which of the following is an acceptable method to determine that your station complies with FCC RF exposure evaluations or ex RF exposure regulations? All those choices are correct. And there, there are steps that it lists that you can take uh, to do a station evaluation, um, things like that. Uh, if it sounds like something that would work to test how much radio signals are coming out or if you're doing anything bad, uh, it's probably a correct answer. So this one, all of these choices are correct, but you might just have to memorize that. What could happen if a person uh, accidentally touched your antenna while you were transmitting? Uh, they might receive a painful RF burn. 
Yeah, RF burns are not fun. We did one in Sea Park uh, once. Someone was silly enough to do one, and they got RF burned. Uh, yeah, do not touch an antenna that is transmitting. Always assume that an antenna is transmitting unless you're absolutely certain that it's not. You know, that's why you check things. Um, yeah, but if you do get, if you do touch it while it's transmitting, you might receive an RF burn. Okay, which of the following actions might amateur operators take to prevent exposure to RF radiation excess of FCC supply limits? Relocate your antennas elsewhere. Put them elsewhere. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully they're not near people as much. Okay, how can you make sure your station stays in compliance, compliance with RF safety regulations by reevaluating the station whenever an item of equipment is changed, right? Pretty straightforward. Whenever you change something in your setup, you want to make sure if it's if you want to make sure that it's in compliance, just reevaluate the whole thing. Okay, what is why is duty cycle one of the factors used to determine safe RF radiation exposure levels? Well, uh, duty cycle is, you know, how much of, if something is on or off for a certain amount of time, then we say that the duty cycle, if this was, uh, this one might be, if this is the cycle of the wave here, this one might be 20% duty cycle. And that means that the average, it's a math thing, but basically if you work out, if this was like power, uh, the duty cycle is important because that determines how much average, like here, this signal might have an average value of low, uh, of a low, uh, a low level. But if this was on for a longer amount of time, then you would have a higher average power. And it's the average power that affects uh, how people uh, are affected by radiation. Uh, oh, was that a uh, question measured in minutes? Is that, was that regarding this one or what question was that for? Oh, duty cycle? No, no, no. It's a unitless. It's like 20%. It's like a frequency. If you have anything that has frequency, this if this were repeating over time, uh, if this was repeating over time, you would just say over one frequency, the percentage of time that it's on versus the time that it's uh, out of the total time is the duty cycle. So if it was on the whole time, it would be 100%. Yeah. All right. There you go. Yeah, it's a unitless measurement. But that's not really important. Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah. Hey, look, this is the question. Yep. What is the definition of duty cycle during the averaging time, the percentage of time that the transmitter is transmitting? Yep. So there you go. Yeah. If it was on for 20% of the time on average, then it would have a 20% duty cycle. If it was on all the time, it would have a hundred percent duty cycle. All right. How does RF radiation differ from ionizing radiation radioactivity? So I explained this one. RF radiation does not have sufficient energy to cause genetic damage. So RF, you know, VH, you know, all your your even your microwave, I mean your cell phone, 5G, things like this, doesn't have enough energy. If you've ever taken a physics, it doesn't have like the elect like the the wave do, does not have enough energy to break the bonds in your DNA. Uh, versus x-rays that's why you have exposure limits for x-rays and things like nuclear workers and stuff because those waves do have sufficient energy to cause genetic damage but rf radiation does not have uh yeah radio radio waves everything's electromagnetic wave right but uh radio waves in particular do not are non-ionizing so they don't have enough energy to cause genetic damage all right if the averaging time for exposure is six minutes how much power density is permitted if the signal is present for three minutes and absent for three minutes rather than being present for the entire? Yes, uh, the exam is at four o'clock, um, which is two minutes ago. Uh, I'll, I, it'll be explained in a second. Um, yeah, the average, basically this one is saying if you, if you uh, transmit, basically the way you can think about these types of questions uh, is, if the average, right, if this one was, uh, that's a bad way to example do it. If you had something where the average was all on for the whole thing, or for half the time, uh, let's see, the present for three minutes, absent for three minutes, you can have twice as much in that average. And these ones, this would have the same average. If you were to take this signal over this time and average it out, the average would be the same as this. So the question here is, you can have more power density, you can have more power density here 
uh, if your signal is uh, present for only half of the thing. So that's what this question is asking. Yep. All right. Oops, mouse. And that's it. All right. Yeah, we're done with uh, T zero. So if there's any, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, uh, I believe uh, Kevin will pop on. Yeah, everybody, give yourselves a round of applause. You, you made, made it. it. You didn't think you would, but you did. Um, so let's play it to your street. We got 90 people who need to test. Um, hey, here, we could go back and review stuff in a minute. Um, but we have 90 people who need to test. We can't just have everybody go in there at once. Um, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to have all of you um, join sometime between, between four and seven. I would like all of you to uh, go on to ham study. That's not the link. Uh, can someone paste the uh, technician pool again? Um, I would like all of you to go to, before you go to take your test, I would like you to go to that link that Jack just posted and try a practice exam. Um, and if you need to study a bit longer, you can do the study mode on there uh, for a bit or come back and ask questions um, or help each other out, et cetera. Um, but yeah, just to, just to get a good, just to get a feel for it. Uh, if, if I were to tell you that you should just go test now, how many of you would want to do that? You can raise your hands on the participants or uh, say something in the chat. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck. Ooh, we got a hand and a thumb up. Okay, that's a good amount of people. Well, I see, I saw about 10 people, or like eight. Okay, assuming that we're being honest. Um, give me one, one second. Uh, Duncan, did you still need a, uh, did you still need a uh, B05 and B12 or did you get them both? Okay, everyone who just raised their hand, uh, you can go ahead and leave the breakout room. And um, Marcel is going to get you all squared away and on your journey. Um, for everybody else, uh, you can feel free to stick around and ask questions or uh, go ahead and take that practice test um, and make sure that you are ready. Uh, are there any questions for me? And I can stick around and answer questions too, if you want. Okay, thank you. Um, and then that's fine. I'll have Helen go to your room and then room one will just be waiting for Jack, which is fine. Yeah, if, that they, if they can wait a little bit. Okay, thank you. After practice thank test, you, oh, Kevin, Kevin, uh, yeah, so you can